this conversation. My name is Michael Deering. I teach in the design school and uh, uh, I have the privilege of um, introducing you to this panel of experts on uh, startup compensation and hiring. Um, before we get into the content, I want to do two things. One is I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, tell you uh, why they're fabulous people to give you advice on this topic. But I uh, would love to know who's in the audience. So if you're starting a company right now, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're currently in a startup and you're here to get help or tactical advice on how to, how to get the best team together, put your hand up. You've already got a startup going. Okay. And if you're not really in any of those buckets, you're just curious about the topic? Okay. A nice mix. A nice mix. So maybe what we could do is just tailor our conversation to the, to the, to the groups that are here. And like I said, it's a nice small room, so we're going to be able to have a conversation and, and hopefully, hopefully do that. So uh, why don't we start, and I'll ask Janice to kick us off with uh, introducing herself and uh, why she's here. So Janice Roberts, and I'm currently with the Mayfield Fund, which is a venture capital firm here in, uh, well, Sand Hill Road, close to Joe. And I've been with Mayfield um, nine years now and investing in a broad range of sectors from communication, software, wireless, mobile, and, and some consumer. So I've, I've been in venture capital in a very interesting time and seen lots of changes in the hiring market from sort of the tail end of one bubble and going through the times to lead us to where we are today. Prior to that, I was at 3Com and Palm for a number of years here in the Valley, having come over from Europe and sold my company to 3Com. So I've gone through many different sort of hiring environments from Europe to here, which is very different, to... Um, the corporate world to the startup environment. So I'd be pleased to share my views with you on that. And as I was just talking to Beth, one of the things that I think is really fascinating today is as you're trying to recruit younger people, millennials plus, the, the working environment is so different. And it, it's a question, I think, of how we as investors, recruiters, really adapt to some of the, the new people that we want to attract as well. So there's a lot of interesting things going on beyond money and mm -hmm. stock and all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fair enough. Great. Hi, I'm Beth Steinberg, and I am an organizational consultant in the Valley, focusing on working with different startups, coaching leaders, helping build culture, putting together performance systems for companies including Mozilla, Lynda.com, Metacafe, lots of companies in the Valley. And prior to that, I had a long background in HR, started my career at Nordstrom um, in, in the olden days and opened up the entire Midwest region, which was really like opening lots of little startups, small stores, you know, all over the Midwest that were doing from 50 to $100 million in revenue. And we had to literally hire 500 to 1,000 people for each of those stores and, and build the culture and um, get everything going. Came to the Valley, had uh, jobs at Hewlett Packard, a couple of startups that were not successful. Um, which was a, a great learning lesson for me. Uh, went to Electronic Arts and helped them kind of move to the, to the digital age from console to digital distribution. And then I was the, the first head of HR at Facebook in the very early days of Facebook when we only had five million users and nobody really knew who we were. We had just uh, moved from uh, just having schools into to letting non-universities uh, sign on to Facebook, was there um, during a high growth period where we went from 150 employees to about 400 plus employees in a year. Lots of changes um, throughout that time period and uh, lots of lessons learned, you know, both about things that really worked well and things that I would do differently from my experience and, you know, happy to, to share all that with you. And as Janice spoke about, I think, you know, beyond all of this, kind of the importance of building culture and finding the right people and keeping the right people is, is one of the most important things that you can focus on um, as a leader as you're, as you're building a company. So lots, lots of perspective on that. Uh, my name is Joe Dobrensky. I'm a human capital partner at Sequoia Capital. I've been in this job since uh, 2002. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, my, my focus is really um, 
uh, to work across our entire portfolio, uh, which is now a global portfolio, and help our companies with everything that has to do with people. So pre-investment, that's more working uh, with my partners to figure out who are the people that come along with these business plans that we receive every day and, and help us assess are these people that we can work with and grow with. Uh, and then I spend the majority of my time post-investment with, you know, when do you hire a VP of sales, uh, how much uh, um, should you pay your people when you're an A-round company, when you're a B-round company, et cetera, uh, and everything else that has to do with, uh, with the human capital function. Before uh, uh, joining uh, Sequoia, I was uh, in Andy's line of work. I was an executive recruiter for a firm called Russell Reynolds, where I did all work in the uh, semiconductor and microelectronic space. I'm uh, Andy Price. I'm one of the managing partners of uh, a company with a terrible name called Schweikler Price Malarkey and Barry. It's the name of the four owners of the firm. But the uh, history of the company is, pre is kind of interesting in my view. We've been around since 1977. My partner recruited for Joe's firm, the CEO of Cisco Systems and Network Appliance and a few other big players. So our, start our DNA of our firm has always been getting involved in formative formation stage companies and helping these companies who are on the edge of innovation and in, by definition in new categories recruit management from industries that aren't obvious. And so that's a fascinating topic and if any of you ever figure out the pattern among it all, then, then tell me. But we, um, about f I've been in the space for about 16 years. Um, I, I went with another firm that merged with this firm I'm with now. And uh, what we've done is we've built one of the lot, probably top three largest independent technology firms, maybe in the world, certainly in the US, we're 30 people. We do about 75 to 85 executive searches a year. And it's all board, CEO, and C-level or VP uh, kind of projects. And about five years ago, we thought when we fired our governor in, in uh, Sacramento over a, a lousy energy policy, I had a, an epiphany and thought that the story of our time was going to be energy and natural resources. So I switched my career from technology and into energy and and clean technology. And from then to now, we've done about 115 searches in space, ranging from automotive components to solar to wind and biofuels and chemicals and all kinds of fascinating categories. So what uh, the company does, broadly speaking, is my partners do social media, internet, digital media related things. Some of the other guys do semiconductor, infrastructure, equipment, comms, wireless, you name it, we're in, in the space. And 90-odd percent of our clients are venture-backed startups. So I'm pleased to be here today, and thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, all four of you, for showing up and, uh, and helping folks understand the perspectives you've got on building teams. Maybe since everybody in the room was either currently running a startup or aspired to do that, I'd love to go, just go right down the line and we'll start in reverse order with Andy. What's the one piece of advice you'd have for somebody creating a team from scratch that, that you'd like to pass on in this format? Yeah, uh, good, timely question. Um, my number one advice, well, it's two, sorry, two things. I'm going to cheat a little bit. It's okay. I think one is you got to go find help. And it's not necessarily with a search firm or a bank. It's really with someone who's in an industry who's grown a company before and can mentor your company, mentor you personally, and is a dispassionate third party that can give you objective advice. For example, if you're going to take money from the institutional investors, which institutional investors are most appropriate? Who's going to help you? Who's, more, who's too oversubscribed to actually give you the time today? They may write you a check, but then they may end up being a bigger problem than an asset. I'd say start with Sequoia, and I'm just, just saying that because Joe's here, or you know, Mayfield, or someone with new money. No, but seriously. I said, or it could be like a Mayfield. Somebody who's got new money, fresh capital, and a good reputation who's an institutional player, or a company who is very much dialed into the space that you're in and has some expertise that they can lend. So I guess the idea is bring in a mentor who's a veteran kind of presence, either on the board or as an advisor, listen to a cross-section of advice, be thoughtful about that first step you take into, um, you know, capitalizing your company. Great advice. Yeah. Mr. D. Uh, I just want to clarify, though, are you talking more about who your partner might be in, in establishing a startup or the first executive hire you bring yeah. on board? Let's do both. Let's talk about picking a partner. So picking a partner, um, first of all, I think it's uh, critical that you have a partner. I don't know how many startups have really gotten off the ground where there was just a single founder. I don't know if you guys have many examples, but I can't think of too many. Um, 
and, and in, in, in picking your partner, I think you got to pick somebody that has the same ideals that you have. And I think you know, you guys are all entrepreneurs. You know what it takes. It takes uh, conviction. It takes an incredible amount of energy. Uh, it takes uh, resilience. Um, you know, a, a lot of people think it's just a lot of fun uh, to be in a startup. Well, it's not all fun. People really appreciate that. You want to have somebody that shares, I think, all those attributes. Uh, in terms of bringing on your first executive, that is really, really tricky. And, and I, I've heard numbers that 50% don't make it. I don't know if that's accurate or not. And so. You know, my advice there would be kind of take your time, get good advice from your venture firm or from uh, whoever else. Your lawyers can be very helpful, uh, and, and and find people that you know have the right experience. You know, have a lot of those same attributes. You know, but but also. Um, uh, you know, somebody that listens well and that you want to work with. You know, you, sometimes people hire the best resume as opposed to the, the person that fits the, uh, you know, fits the organization up front. So just a few thoughts. Mm -hmm. Great ones. Um, I, I agree with everything uh, that Joe said, and I think it's, it's really important to hire somebody that is not in your same image. Um, it's a quote from Dehawk that said, you know, don't, um, you know, don't hire somebody in your own image. Look to fill your deficits, not duplicate your strengths. And you know, we like ourselves. We like to hire people that are similar than we are. But I think from a skill set perspective, you really need to get a, 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 a different skill set than your own. I think from a value and integrity perspective, it's absolutely imperative that, that you're aligned on, on that piece of it, but look for somebody who can do things that are different than, than you can do, that may have a contrary opinion than you do on things, um, because I think that's where you get the best answer. Um, and as Joe said, it's, it's, it's really important that you take your time with it and really make the best decision. You know, as you're growing a company, those first three or four leaders that you hire really set the cultural tone for the company. Um, and if you make a mistake there, it can really, you know, prevent you from moving as quickly as, as you could have if you if you made the right decision. So um, that's my advice. The other thing too is don't pretend as a leader that you know things that you don't know. Um, you know, I think it's it's sometimes difficult to admit we don't know things, but nobody knows everything. And I think you need to really seek out somebody who can help you um, figure out those things that you are not um, well versed on. Great advice, Janice. Yeah, you know, I think it, the the real phase that's very delicate is when you've got um, you know founding team who's starting to grow the company and realizes that they need to bring in you know a professional, if you like, and so. And that is a very sort of delicate sort of time and I do think it is helpful to have help whether it's from your investor from someone who's got a human capital sort of orientation like Joe or indeed from a recruiter that being said I think even with a recruiter often internal referrals are very helpful but you can still put them into mm -hmm. the pot but you know having sort of a frame of reference from people you know can be very helpful when you're bringing someone new into your company. And I think as a founder, you really need to be very open-minded. At the same time, you really need to believe that this person that you're bringing on board to share in your company is really going to have similar values, similar dreams, similar visions. So I think the key thing there is really taking time, take references, work with other people, just really take sort of time about it. When you're starting to build up your team, one of the things that comes up a lot is whether you recruit specialists or generalists, and there's probably a combination of both. That's another thing to think about. You know, certainly when you're talking about you know, bringing people in with certain engineering skills, you need domain expertise and so on. But one thing to think about as you're building your team is that you will adapt your business. It's very, very few businesses end up being what they start out to be. So you do need people who are not going to be focused on a, a job description, people who really want to help you build the company. So I think you know, really strong general, generalists, yeah, they would have some, obviously, domain expertise as well, can be very important as well. And, and you know, we talk about getting the best that you can, you can get, but at the same time, these issues of feeling you want to work with that person, feeling you can work, work with that person, feeling that you have the same ethics, work orientation, goals, is, is really, really important because it can be, you know, it's a fabulous time when you're starting out with a company. You get financing, you're starting to get 
momentum. But then you have to build the company and you start to build, bring in people who were not part of the founding team. It's a sort of, there's a lot of tension there. So you really need to spend time on it and be thoughtful. Great advice. I'll, I'll, see, I'll keep seeding the uh, conversation with one more question and, uh, off my list and then we'll open it up to everybody. Um, a lot of people choose the early stage or the venture <laughs> career path because they want to be owners. Mm -hmm. and they, either as founders or as, uh, as uh, smaller, owner, smaller share owners, but owners nonetheless. How do you think about the problem of dividing equity, both between founders and between those first few hires? And what rules of thumb have you seen people use that, was, that really made a difference on the plus side? And also, what are some of the watch outs that you've seen in either in your portfolio companies or companies that you've been a part of? Dividing equity is probably one of the hardest choices you have to make. We're going to start here? Or the other yeah, end? anybody who wants to just jump well, in. We see about 100, uh, we see probably in aggregate about 180 to 250 startups a year. So we'll, we'll look at things, and if we look at them as a potential client and we think it's got a, a hairy cap table or something along those lines, we think the company is wired for failure. And a lot of it has to do with exactly what Michael's talking about. It's that you have, you know, people have expectations. The entrepreneur's expectations these days are, in some cases, still a little high, especially in the energy space. They think it's a frothy space, and it is, and it's been overinvested in and things like that. And so there's a, there's a bubble aspect to it. And I think the thinking about budgeting equity for the long haul, can you maintain a 20% employee pool, right? So 20% of the cap table should be, in my view, set aside for management and the employees. If it's any less than that, I really think your employees are going to be in there for the wrong reasons. They're going to need more cash or whatever. And that's a, to me, you should really always try and maintain and protect that employee equity base. Um, founders we typically see end up at liquidity at between, and Joe would know way better than I would, but on my frame of reference, it's about 3 to 7% at liquidity for the CEO for the yeah, for the CEO and then usually the founders are somewhere within striking distance of the CEO and then the management ends up with you know half a percent to maybe one and a half percent range at at liquidity again so you start so you say okay we're starting here what are our assumptions in terms of how much capital we're going to need and you work back from that and budget that equity the same way you would budget cash and be very and have that cap table in front of you at all times understanding that equity distribution and, and I'll give quickly a funny example in the beginning of Cisco my partner was doing a VP of sales search uh, and the CEO before that guy was replaced came said to the VP of sales hey uh, I'm gonna give you or the sales guy said how much how much equity are you setting aside he says 4% so the sales guy that he was trying to hire said well I'm gonna get a 4% of Cisco systems it turns out it was 4% set aside for the whole management team, and the board had a pretty, pretty toxic reaction to this. This is so ancient history, I'm sure I'm not outing anybody here, but the point is, is don't be awkward or clumsy with the distribution of that equity because it is your most precious resource, in my personal view, or one of them. A few other um, kind of related comments. Number one, just plan ahead. Uh, you know, don't start your company with with a de minimis option pool. Mm -hmm. um, it just creates lots of problems. And and really, really plan ahead. Figure out, okay, we're going to hire three types of engineers, and here's the band of equity we're going to give them. And be willing to crack the code occasionally, but try not to often. A, a typical mistake companies make is they have their first executive they're going to bring on board, and and this is a problem just with titles and with equity. You've got an EVP. And, and he wants four points of the company, and then every subsequent hire becomes a nightmare because people talk, people find out. So that's w one lesson. Another one is don't skimp with equity. I think everybody in the company, from the receptionist through the CEO, all should get equity in the company. Um, we emphasize equity more than cash. Uh, uh, you know, try and keep salaries low. But I, you know, I think you guys all are aware of that. Uh, so a couple points. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that, and I, I you know, you guys are more probably more versed on it. Uh, in totality than I am, but I think in general don't get too greedy yourself because nobody can do it on their own. Your team is so important to you and you know I think it's such a rewarding feeling to know that you know the receptionist got equity and made you know at Cisco the receptionist 
has her own plane now. You know, I think to me that is such a, a story of Silicon Valley and you know such a great result of, of how things work in the valley. So don't get too greedy yourself. The difference between you know 15% and 13% is so minimal when it's you know when it's large numbers and you really need to keep that team engaged and retained and you know in a startup equities th the way that you do that i think on the other hand though don't over focus on it because you, you know you don't want people coming into your company only because they think they're going to get rich i mean you want people to believe in the team and believe in the product and know they're going to work really really hard and this is this might take 10 years or more um, so don't overemphasize it too much, um, you know, and and you'll really have to screen and make sure that people want the right things when they're when they're coming to your company. Great point. Yeah, a couple of points I would make there. So, um, so first of all, I think as as the managers of a company or the CEO of a company, it, as best as you can, it's great to keep the interests of everybody aligned. So obviously, you know, stocks can be distributed in different amounts, but. Really bringing everybody together and getting everybody feeling they're part of the company is really important. The other thing that's important and can be difficult to do is to keep investors and management aligned. And, and sometimes, and you alluded to it, um, cap structures can get too complicated, and, and, and particularly if a company's been around for a while. And so I, w I personally like to keep things quite simple because I think that's the best way to keep everybody aligned, but sometimes you know, cap structures can get complicated with preferences and so on. And sometimes those structures can compensate for people wanting overly high valuations and things like that. So I think working with the team that you have around you, with your investors, um, you know, with your legal counsel and so on, keeping it as simple and as aligned as possible is really, really important. And I've worked for a company where, you know, when stock is distributed and the company is doing well and everybody benefits, it's just a phenomenal thing. And people work harder. You know, and, and they feel great, and obviously there are financial benefits, but you also feel really good about being part of this sort of winning organization, and it, it's just a great thing. Now, on the other hand, there are some challenges today because the liquidity market is not as good as it was some years ago. And so, you know, it can take time for you to get to that exit point. And this time can end up leading to more complicated cap tables and so on. And so on exit, you can get all sorts of complications in terms of carve-outs and things like that. So again, try to minimize that. But also, in, in it, and it tends to vary by sector, and I, Joe obviously is right, we try, try to get people focused on the equity component. But you know, we're seeing now in this valley, I think, across a lot of companies that there's a relatively stronger emphasis on the cash and bonus components of compensation, you know, from the CEO down. So people are looking for more cash, higher bonuses, contracts, and things like that. And when I came here from Europe, it was sort of at will, you know, risk. It's you know, and and, and this is what the valley is all about. And I'm seeing a little more structure come into these compensation environments and also this you, know, you actually are seeing some people who are sort of okay I've been working at this startup for years and now uh, my kids going to college and my wife's putting pressure on me maybe I should go back and work for Cisco for a couple of years to pay for the college fees or something you know because the exit's not coming but you know I think that you know I'm sort of giving you anecdotes to make a point but I do think there's some sort of change here that we have to sort of think about with the exit environment you know taking some time in certain sectors. Mm -hmm. All great points. I might add one best practice to think about that I've seen. Since a lot of you are in positions where you're going to be hiring younger folks who might not have actually had the experience of being shareholders in the company they worked at before, I've seen some founders take some really um, valuable and worthwhile time out to explain how does a cap table work, yeah. who owns what and why. And you might not get down to the to the Nats ass of detail on who has how many shares, but you might just take the time to explain what does it mean to be an owner and what's the difference between preferred and common and how does vesting work. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how many people don't actually know um, and would love it if you would tell them how it all works mechanically. Uh, you'll be doing them a huge favor, probably saving yourself a lot of mm -hmm. questions too. Um, Wait, there's a little anecdote there. When I sold yeah. my company to, to 3Com, 
many of the employees were from Europe. And this was you know, a few years back. And it was interesting. They said, Janice, we love this deal. You know, we're very happy with the cash and our jobs and else, but we don't really want to handle options. It's too complicated. We Give them back. <laughs> and of course, these people now made, made tons of money, but it was really interesting. But you had to explain it. You know, they just sort of give it back. Yeah. <laughs> very funny. Yeah. So maybe what we could do now is open it up. And again, thank goodness we're in this room, uh, which makes a conversation possible. Um, I'll just start uh, looking sort of left to right and see we've got a question in the back row. Please go ahead. I think a lot of us uh, realize that the founder keeps his job and can continue going on as the CEO if they hire better people in every functional position inside the company. Um, that's either easier said than done. Can you give us some tactics to actually accomplish that? Joe. Yeah, Joe. This is you. You can start. Off. <laughs> so specifically, you know, what to look for, and or put a little finer point in the question, if you if you would. Yeah. So uh, since I started a company, you know, we have lots of users, we have um, some angel money. Uh, now I need to build out the team. Yeah. Right. I'm okay at marketing, sales, finance, strategy, etc. But okay is not good enough to take the company to the next level. Mm -hmm. Right. How should I think about, or specifically tactically, how do I actually go out and get those A++ plus plus players yeah. so that my company can't be $100 million for the integrators? And well, they heard a subtext there, which is so that the founder could have a shot at staying CEO. Yeah. Right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so the VCs don't choose. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. First off, let me, let me start with this. I mean, Sequoia mm -hmm. over the years has gotten a little bit of, of, of grief, I think, incorrectly for, for firing founders, to tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, Michael knows a lot of our companies. That's actually really not all that true. And we really want to find a founder who can be a CEO and turn into Jensen at NVIDIA yeah. or Omar at AdMob in a more recent story. Uh, you know, there are, there are many others. So, just I wanted to put, put that on the record. Uh, secondly, I think you really have to understand, caucus with your advisors as to what you're trying to accomplish. If this is an R&D mission for the, you know, for the next year, you really need to bring on marketing and sales. I notice a lot of companies seem to, okay, I've, I've got a million bucks now, let me go hire a full team, and do you, do you really need that? Um, but as we talked about before, I think it's understand what your capabilities are, and project yourself out to the org chart a year from now, and, and what will you be doing, and then hire somebody that compliments yourself. I don't think it's necessarily rocket science. Uh, and I go back to the, the, the point also of hiring somebody that fits into the culture. Don't look at the resume. You know, look at, look at the person. Is this somebody who can grow with the company, who I can work with, who can help me meet other people, who can help me recruit? Uh, and then lastly, recruiting takes a ton of time. People don't realize that. Uh, I tell a lot of our companies, oh, I don't want to go spend $100,000 on, on Andy. <laughs> and uh, as a former re recruiter, you know, I, I have a lot of experience. If, if you really need to recruit an A person, you either, as a founder, need to devote probably a third of your time, yeah. seriously, a third of your time yeah. to recruiting, Her. or you stomach the yeah. fee and pay Andy. Uh, and if you really want to hire an A person, and still pay, spend 15 percent of your time. Yeah. Well, maybe it's now 80. It's yeah. yeah. a lot of time. And, and I think you also have to to put your ego aside, which I I know you know can be really hard. But you need to really think about. Am going forward, am I the best person to run this company? I mean, being a CEO is an awesome responsibility in in every way. I mean, and everything that you say, your employees are going to, you know, take it to heart. You know, general management is such a hard thing to do. So I think, you know, and, and I've seen lots of success stories um, of, of founders making it. And I, I've seen, um, you know, big battles where, you know, the board wanted to take a CEO out and the CEO didn't want to leave. And I think you have to really think about it and, and really take it to heart. Am I the best person to build this company or do I need a partner um, to help me do so. Well, here's here's one other thought. Uh, and Janice, you know this company I'm referring to. It can remain nameless for now, but there's a company that's well, doing. Well, we know it's a There's a company that's doing uh, green chemicals. So they take uh, raw material, glucose in this case, and then future it'll be cellulosic, and then they process that into uh, intermediate chemicals. And so I call that a renewable chemicals kind of company. So uh, the founder actually was the first to raise his hand about two years ago and say, hey, you know, I think we need a chemical. This is a biotech PhD. It says, uh, hey, I need you to go board and find me a CEO. It's his idea. Board goes out and finds a CEO. CEO comes in, makes a pretty good impact. But at the end of the day, had real ego issues with the board. And so that person couldn't control his ego as a big personality. 
And the founder really did everything he could to empower that person. Once he made that decision, he had faith. He just got behind the person, and they had good experience together. Ultimately, the board fired the guy and ends up uh, putting the founder back into, this, into the saddle. That founder, to your direct point, tactically, what he did is he said, okay, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna build the office of the CEO. And he said, what am I gonna have on my left hand? I need a strong technology person from, in this case, the industrial biotech space. Mm -hmm. Ends up keeping that person engaged and his message to that person, who could go do his own company and is a superstar in his own right, he said, look, I need you to be my partner. I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to stay out of your day-to-day -day business. I'm not going to micromanage I'm not going to be paranoid about whether or not you're getting your, your work done. You know, you're getting it done. And then goes out to the commercial side. We ended up hiring a former CEO of a pretty significant business in that space and convinced that person to partner with this founder. They created the office of the CEO. So thinking, listening to the people you want to hire and saying, how can I make this work within your life, throw you some touchdown passes, uh, we'll have a, you know, and this is going to sound really corny, but appealing to pre people's sort of passion and personal interests and saying, you know, you could go off and be the CEO of something else or you could go out, but, but get behind me on this thing. We'll work as a team and we'll really build a company together and being honest about that. And then after the fact, you close a person delivering on that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you either have that person run, don't shoot at their feet, let them run or, or don't hire them in the first place. Right. But that was, I think this guy was a great example of I mean, He's a 35 year old, you know, PhD with no operating experience is turning out to be a heck of a CEO. Yeah. Just raised a bunch of money, about 40 million bucks in this market at a very, at a pretty solid valuation was, was really surprising to a lot of people. You know, a couple of points I would make there. Um, so first of all, you know, you recognize this. If you find a company, then you bring in, you know, venture capital, the dynamics of running the company change. Obviously you're giving up some control. I think it's really important, and you have a say in this, that you bring the right people, you know, assuming you have a choice to invest in your company and build the right board and so on. And, um, you know, I would have a very open dialogue with that, you know, say you have, you know, a small board with your board about, you know, how you're doing and, 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 and where you need help and so on. And I would echo, Joe, that certainly it's very rewarding for us as VCs to see a founder become the CEO and be successful. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. I mean, obviously we all like to make money and everything else, but seriously, I mean, it's very, very rewarding for see that to happen. And you know, then you don't have some of this tension along the way as well. But also I think you as a founder need to be, and you, you pointed this out, Beth, you need to be very clear about not just what your capabilities are and which stage of your career you're at, but also what you like to do. Because often a founder is more interested in technology or being the evangelist than running the day-to-day -day operations. And you know, I'm a big sort of believer still in you know, Jim Collins and his view that you need an outside, inside person. I think teams can be you know, much more productive than an individual. The other thing is running a company is sort of a lonely job in many respects as you change. You know, when you're sort of handful of you sort of building out a technology, it's, it's one thing. When you start to organize, it becomes, and you have to at some point, there needs to be some organization, it starts to change and, and your job becomes very different. So mm -hmm. really leverage the people who are investing in your company. You know, we don't have a human capital people, but we have VCs, but you know, people like Joe, you know, go and sit with them and really sort of understand where you're good, where you're not so good, how you can grow. Is it time for me to be CEO now? But And if I continue along this path, am I going to hamper the company? Or is there someone I could bring in that could really help me achieve what I want for my company? And then maybe next time I'll be the CEO. And you know, there's things like that to consider. But also, and you know, this is the best network in the world, right, here in the Valley, which is why we create these great companies. You know, really leverage the people, you know, other people who've done it before, CEOs, you know, mentors. You know, we talk about this all the time. But, you know, many of the people who've been successful have been able to reach out to people they know or people who know someone who know someone. And, and I would, you know, just do that. But, you know, having the, the open conversation so that you're not surprised by the board and, you know, just is, 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 is really important and, and really develop that relationship. And you just be very sort of clear about yourself. And yeah, everybody sort of thinks they want to be the CEO and you talk a lot of, to a lot of company public company CEOs, and they say, my best job was actually the job before this, yes. because this is all admin, you know, particularly today. So you need to think about that as well, you know, what's, what do I really enjoy? And, and then, you know, again, coming back to if you do bring in a, a CEO, you know, there are professional CEOs and they're fine, but also bring in someone who shares your passion, right. particularly in this industry, in the tech industry, 
you know, I've seen instances where bigger companies have brought in professionals and they don't really like products, and that doesn't work, you know, so think about that. And I think Andy said something really important, um, which I've seen derail companies over and over again, is don't bring in really smart people to help you and then don't give them any control or autonomy to, to do that. Um, it's the worst thing to, to be micromanaged and not have the ability to innovate um, and make decisions. So just you know, make sure that from a personal perspective, you're ready to let go of some control before you start bringing in a team. And you know, this hiring thing, you will make mistakes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You will make absolutely. mistakes. Trust me, you will. Mm -hmm. So it's coincidence that Zach has his hand up because I was going to cold call him now because he's the only one with a name tag I can actually read. <laughs> Which to me is the international symbol for please call on me. So, so. I was wondering if you could speak to the very early stages of, of people forming a company and looking for small, specifically for, say, a technical co-founder. Mm. So how do you speak to how you think about sort of splitting equity to start with? And I presume you're going to say you should do mm. everything, which is fine. But what, what I'm very interested in is how can you de-risk that relationship very early on? Because that's when your company is not even a company and you're thinking about it and you've got this great vision and you find when you think you share that vision and you want to bring along as a co-founder. How, how do you sort of de-risk that relationship? Because I imagine if that doesn't work, um, you guys then you're in trouble because you've given you you know, you the company, company away. And, yeah. you know. I'll throw out something. I've seen a lot of companies come, guys, people come together and have seen it work and not work. And founder dynamics, I asked Dan Warmanhoven one time, what was his ultimate secret to making uh, network appliance into a multi-billion dollar company? His number one thing he said was not VCs, wasn't, any, wasn't headhunters, wasn't anybody else. It was, I engaged the founders and gave them a role, I mean, meaningful role. And you know, uh, uh, the Google founders are a great example of sort of people that know each other. My one advice would be work together before you give up the equity right. and before you truly capitalize the company. Before you form that true cap structure, that cap table, to divide up the equity, start working together as though this is a small project. That small project becomes Hewlett Packard potentially. You know, there's a couple of people working in a garage, getting to know each other, understanding whether they can live in the foxhole together. Think of it as like a foxhole. It's a battle out there. And don't want to be cynical, it is very intense out there, as you know, once you get into the Real, once your company becomes you know, uh, visible and financed, you've got all kinds of new responsibilities that are gonna mushroom out. And uh, making sure you're in that foxhole with someone you can trust and that shares your vision and stylistically you're compatible. It's very intimate, it's like dating before you marry someone. I mean, it's very similar. So let's assume that they do that and they do it really well. Is 50-50 the right answer? What are they bringing to the table? Yeah, yeah I think it's a negotiation. I think you, know, you have too. to, yeah. I don't think it's obviously 50-50, but you know, just back to your point, this getting to know each other, you know, whether it's, and, and, and you're seeing it more now actually with this sort of try and bind from recruiting generally, but really get to know each other before you solidify it. And sometimes it can be a friend, sometimes not, but don't, I think the friend thing, you've got to be a little delicate about that, you know, I think it need, really needs to be someone who's going to contribute, that you can work with, similar visions, but just, you know, play it out a bit if you can, before you, before you determine the capital structure. And one other point, um, uh, if you do plan to raise a venture round, and it's interesting, we have two co-founders in the room, one of our companies uh, right now, uh, we are, very, part of my job, we are very analytical about the chemistry between the founders when huh. we work with them as part of the yeah, yeah. exercise. I'm sure you're the same thing. Right. It's frequent where one person does all the talking and somebody doesn't say anything, or you can see the body language between people, so. Mm -hmm. Um, very important point with your, your potential future investors. And it impacts how you decide to invest, right, Joe? Yeah, for that sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and you'll find some people, when you're recruiting, you're very early on, they'll want co-founder status. You need to be very careful yeah. about that, to your point, right? So co-founder status tends to mean stock and control and all those types of things. But really think about it. Think about what this person is going to contribute. But you're right. You've got to spend time with them. So do you think, um, just to develop on that point, you know, if you've got, say, one or two people you're working with, to try to make that process last as long as possible, that sort of, sort of project status, sort of, and then try and turn it into something that becomes kind of more serious, I guess. So you want to try to sort of extend that process as long as possible. What do you think, about six months? Work together three, six months? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you really have to know that you're aligned in your vision. You have to know that you're aligned in your values, and you have to, you know, what be very clear about what those people are bringing 
to the table and you genuinely have to like those people. I mean, like Andy said, you are in early startup days, as, as many, of you, many of you know, it is not pretty. I mean, it is very hard and you, it, you know, tough times and, you know, people tend to be quite emotional and lots of hard work and you really have to like the people that and respect the people that you're working with. So I think, you know, I couldn't say X amount of time is the magic answer, but I think you should know. I mean, in your gut, you know, everyone's very analytical and I appreciate that, but I think in your gut, if you have a doubt, it's probably not the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, at the early stage, it's not like you're on a trajectory, an action-orientated trajectory. You're actually thinking about what this company can be. And there's lots of dialogue and lots of brainstorming. So it really is, you know, being able to work with that person and then, you know, be able to, to make decisions from that because there comes a point where, you know, you can brainstorm forever and not get anywhere. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's got to be someone that you can really sort of evolve and, and, and build something from. So, you know, those relationships when they work, you know, Google, or whatever, yeah. are really fabulous. But, you know, there's, there's lots of tales where it, it gets a little tense along the way. One last idea. Check the other person out. Do, do your homework. Oh, yeah. Come up Absolutely. with your own references and say to that person, hey, we're going to go form this company. We're going to divide up the equity. Let's make sure we really know each other and we'll do it in the spirit of understanding each other. So do the references contextually. Check that person out. Say, hey, who would you, who have worked with you in the past? And let me give you some of my references. And you have them written down. Here you go. And it, it, it's, it, that's a little bit of an awkward conversation, potentially, but I think it warrants, because you may find out the person's going through a messy divorce, has uh, you know eight DUIs in their name or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, there, there are some people that look great. Six is the target number. Right, six, yeah. <laughs> that have done prison fine. stints, you know, who knows? <laughs> it, you, you know, it, it's so really doing the homework on who that person is behind their, yeah. behind the persona is an important step. And I sometimes have, you know, I have a group of, people that I've worked with, I really trust. I sometimes have those people meet people that I'm going to work closely with to say, just go have a meal together and just yeah. give me, you know, because people tend to get enamored with one another, you know, quite quickly. And then you realize maybe it is going to work or not. So I sometimes let somebody I really trust have a meal with the person and say, what do you think? You know, give me your perspective. So last row, guy in the white shirt. Mm -hmm. So maybe in between the stage of Zach and Kayvon we're talking about, so really early stage with have some founders, thinking about bringing on more people, um, how do you divide the amount of compensation between equity and very small amounts of capital that you may have personally, so very small, I mean microscopic. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how do you think about sort of that Especially if you're in a market that you think maybe winner take all and you have to move fast. Your thoughts? Are you looking at the ratio between, are you looking at the correlation between cash and equity? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how do you like divide that if you're trying to find people who are obviously awesome, but you may need some like interns and stuff. And specifically, if you give the interns equity. Don't do, really it. Don't, do it. Yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't ever give equity to people who aren't going to be long-term contributors to the company. Okay. Like I said, there's only so much to go around. Including yeah. uh, executive recruiters? Well, we actually don't do, we actually, about 90% of our searches, we do get options to invest in the company. Otherwise, there's no reason to recruit. Were you talking about like Harry Cap tables earlier? Is well, that what you mean? Well, no, yes, the, yes. The, the, but the cap tables evolve. I think that early on, you know, you're putting a company together, you probably don't have any have cash. Any cash yeah. I mean, right. Facebook early days, I mean, that's what they had to do, you know, to, to get to get people. But I think, you know, it depends on how much capital you have. I mean, it's hard to find people in the Valley right now unless they're really junior that are going to take a job with very little cash. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, you know, like Dana said, kind of the, the days of big liquidity, people potentially see are gone. So I think you have to be really careful yeah. about who you're looking to hire and be really clear about here's what we can offer for now. But, you know, if we raise around, you know, you have to really look at changing things. You know, when I, when I came onto Facebook, one of the first things I did when I got there after a round had been raised and things were in a much better per, uh, cash perspective, we had to uh, re-level everybody and realign everybody's comp. You know, people had taken very small cash comp and, and we fixed that for everybody because that was the right thing to do. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's something that you would have to think about doing. But it, it will be a little bit of a challenge, I think. 
I would also right. suggest, by the way, that you pay yourself as little as possible I agree. In, in, in general. I agree. And, and in fact, some of your first employees might make more than you as the founder. Agreed. Uh, particularly if you need to hire somebody with a little bit of experience who has uh, a mortgage to pay, uh, et cetera. We see a lot of companies, they do their you know, $2 million A round and then want to make you know, $175,000, and the world doesn't work that way. I could not agree more. I mean, I think as an early employee in a startup, it's a huge turnoff you know, when you're when executives make so much more than um, than rank and file people, I think there should be just a lot of compression and comp in early startups. Yeah. Let's and go then here. as you say, as you build, you level along then the way. Then you level. Right. Raise money, you got to move fast, is that what you're done? Now you're on. Can you talk a little bit tactically how to create this long-term alignment with your early employees? Is that through like vesting equity and or withholding equity? And how long would you have that vest, three years? Four years, I mean, four minimum. Four minimum. Four minimum, I agree with that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, in terms of alignment, you know, obviously different jobs would have different compensation at some point and, and, and different sort of equity levels, but you, you do align through, you know, fairness, really. You know, you pay for a contribution. I'm really a big believer in, sounds an obvious thing to say, but it's not always the case, paying for performance. Yeah. So that that's really key, but in order to pay for performance, you have to measure that performance, mm -hmm. right? So that's really something, that's the way of aligning people so that they believe that they are being paid for their performance as you as you go through. And I know it tends to sound sort of very sort of, um, you know, heavy in terms of workload, but at some point you have to do that. But I think the key thing is that I personally believe, you know, some people try and adapt by changing vesting schedules and different things like that for different people. I, I'm really not a fan of that. I think okay. there's certain things like vesting schedules for stock that should be consistent. Now, you know, in any situation, there are always going to be exceptions to rules, but generally, I think you start going down the path of offering different people different conditions beyond, you know, some sort of structure for pay and performance, then I think it gets very difficult. And this could be an area, too, where having a good relationship with um, other entrepreneurs or uh, legal counsel can help you because there's a lot of stuff that's market. Right. And you can simplify radically the process of building the team by just adopting what's market. Mm -hmm. And just as an example, the one-year cliff with a four-year vest is essentially market right. in right. Silicon Valley. Right. So that can, that can just save a whole lot of time and trouble by just adopting market practices wherever possible. Yeah, you know, and, and we don't tend to like to talk too much about lawyers, right? But, you know, actually, um, <laughs> having, there are some great, there are. seriously, some great lawyers in this there valley, are. some great counsel. And you know, we can talk about them, advise them, but there's some really good people who can really work with you well to set up the right structure for your company and give you the right advice early on. And you know, the, these, the legal counsel, that they tend to be on multiple boards at different stages, and they have partners who are on multiple boards at different mm -hmm. stages. And so they, they really can help you in terms of you know, what's you know, market and what are best practices, what's work, what's not. Yeah. And I think in, in, in terms of driving alignment, I mean, certainly compensation is one part of it, but there's so much more to right. that, right? right. Point. So right. much point. more. Let's Culture. come back on this side and see, uh, I have a left-hand bias, so I want to be aware. Alex? Sure. Um, well, this question is relevant to two others, but if uh, I'm an MBA student, so when I'm ready to graduate, I'm going to have a good amount of loans, um, also have some cash if I can pay off. Uh, a big percentage of those loans. Uh, I also could use that cash to invest it in my company. Uh, if I invest in my company, I'm going to have to pay the interest. If I have to pay the interest, I'm going to ask, have to get a higher salary. Uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you think about that, that kind of we needed Susie Orman on this panel, I think. <laughs> I, know, I know what she would say because I watch the show she every night. She would say pay so. the loans, right? No. 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 Okay. What does she say? So if Susie were here... Just pretend you're uh, <laughs> Okay, listen. That's what she would do. Um, that was a bad Susie Orman impression. Um, so uh, the student loans are probably at extraordinarily low interest rates with extremely flexible payback. Um, if you've got a choice between paying off a really low interest loan and perhaps investing in or living off of your savings, which probably has a higher return rate. Um, it, it, think about it that way and it becomes a little easier to decide to just pay the minimums on those, let those out there. You see a lot of people letting student loans go to full maturity before they pay them back because the terms and, and interest rates are so flexible or so, so advantageous. Um, it really is kind of like a marginal, uh, what do I do with that last dollar? What's the highest return for that dollar? It's probably feeding you and keeping you going on your entrepreneurial venture rather than 
um, paying the, the loans back early. That's what Susie would say, and I guess I believe that too, because I just paid my last student loan off about five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think exactly. How, how, how do you then take it? Uh, that means I don't put any money in my business, and so I'm going to present to investors and say, "What do you put in? I'm not putting in anything." I, I disagree, which is you're putting your life into your business, and, and if you do the opportunity cost of your time, I mean, you could leave here tomorrow, I mean, no offense by picking this number, but probably make hundreds of thousands of dollars next year if you took a boring job at some consulting firm, um, you know, um, but, you, but, but instead you're going to actually be plowing that resource, which society values. I don't know, again, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, no offense, maybe it's millions for you, but, but into your business. That's free contribution of huge value. You should count that. Sorry. Susie will go home. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so. so say you've raised money and you figured out who the founders are, now you want to hire your first few employees. How do you think about, I mean, someone mentioned earlier the great point that oftentimes the people that you're bringing on who are really good, they can start their own thing. How do you reconcile that with uh, both ego and also the fact that you don't have that much equity to do at this point? Great question. I don't think there's a magic answer yeah, for either. that one. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult. And it's, uh, again, recruiting is really, really hard. And uh, we spend a ton of time on that particular point. But I, I think you, you use your board, if you have a board, uh, to help explain uh, that uh, this is an important company. Um, and that the role will be critical and there's great experience uh, and, and you use whatever tools you have but it's, it's 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 really really difficult but you really need to be careful back to an earlier point not to cave on that first hire and yeah. give away yeah. five points because it just creates so many problems down down the road but i wish i had a magic answer for you well here's one thought i, I keep it to yourself what you're doing as long as you can if you, what you want to do is really interesting and impactful protect it as well as you can you want to guard that secret and generally listen more than you're selling. I hear a lot of excitement about starting a company and you almost feel like there's this vibe of, I can't wait to bring other people involved and that's wonderful. But be careful what you're asking for there. And I'm not saying, like I said, to be cynical and you don't want to be on the other side too trusting. But I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs hang around other entrepreneurs and then all of a sudden you had three companies that all look exactly the same as opposed to one that was ready to break out. You see what I'm saying? So be careful about I would say try and get yourself positioned so that you have an unfair advantage early on and maybe some strategic component to your business, whether it's a patent that you file or to get some action on or some strategic money or a key you know, active chairman or something like that, some industry veteran that you're associated with, whatever it is that the other people say, you know what, it's probably better to go with you and be part of your team than to compete with you. Right, and, and that's, so make sure you have your ducks in order before you really let out, even to anybody, what you're, what you're really trying to do. It's, my it's, a, it's a great question and a, and a, and a bit of a, a, a personal choice as to how you tackle that. I'd love to go back to the canned questions because we had one that was pretty interesting that no one's brought up yet. If the success rate of hiring is 50-50 on those first few non-founder hires, how do you decide I'm going to fire you, here's how I'm going to fire you, and here's how we're going to like recover from that. How do you work through that? I, I mean, I've unfortunately had to, to do that a lot, um, and it's, it's a very painful thing to do. And I think you have to be really sure that it's the right thing to do. You have to be very clear that you know, you have held up your end of the bargain um, in, in that relationship, but it's sometimes it's just not going to be, you know, either it wasn't the right, the right job, you know, it wasn't the right culture fit for whatever reason, sometimes it's just not going to work. And I think when you know that that's the right thing to do, you have to act swiftly. I think if somebody doesn't fit, um, it can really make a big problem within your company. Um, how to do it um, gracefully and respectfully. Um, that's, that's all I can, can say about how to do it. It's hard. It's going to be one of the hardest things you'll do in, in your career. But you have to make sure that you treat people with respect when you do that. Unless they've done something, what I say, illegal or immoral, you own 50% of that failure. Mm -hmm. You know, when you hire somebody that doesn't work, you cannot blame that on solely on that person. That's your deal as well. So make sure that you work out a way that, you know, people go go away as uh, gracefully as possible. But act act swiftly. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. 
I was just going to say a small point there, and also be generous when you exit yeah, somebody. I agree. If somebody's been there 11 months, you know, give them their That's cliff. Right. Don't right. go crazy. Yeah. Uh, but it's a small world, and it's such a connected world that people will find out that. So just be generous. That's a great point that Joe made there. I think that's really key. Some people try and nickel and dime. And it's, you just Not got to right. think about the big picture here. And it's, it's a small world, you know, a small valley. You know, a couple of things I would say when you're recruiting and, and things that might lead to this, this type of decision is that, you know, I've worked for large companies, worked for small companies, startups, and invest in startups. And, um, you know, one of the things that you do have when you're involved in a large company and you have maybe a big department, a big organization, you have the opportunity to nurture people and to grow them. In an early stage company, you don't have that luxury. You need people who are going to come in and be effective. And so sometimes you see people who don't quite fit and you think, well, you know, I can help them. Mm -hmm. Well, you won't be able to help them because you won't have the time. They have to perform. And the other thing is, you know, you're seeing someone is not performing. You can be assured that your team is also seeing that. So to your point, if you let it sort of linger, then it just becomes a bad situation for everybody, actually. But I think how you do it is as important as, you know, when you do it and, and doing it. it it's, it's a tough situation, but doing, you know, sometimes you're going to have to let people go and just do it well. Okay, yes, in the back row. Um, yeah, I'd love to get your perspective on a situation. I don't know if we can get with a where... Essentially, he's putting in a lot of sweat equity, and he has silent partners, and they've all invested cash. But um, basically, all the cash is going to kind of product development, marketing, etc. There's, there's no, no one's getting a salary right now. So the question is, should he be looking at trying to, I guess, negotiate? They, they haven't finalized their cash structure. Um, trying to negotiate a higher portion of the equity, or should he be looking at more from a perspective of he's earning maybe a good salary, just basically setting his salary so that he does eventually get paid for all the, I guess, on the ground work he's doing. Do you really want to write a big check as soon as you've gotten yeah. financed? That's a liability to your investors. We'll say, what, I owe this person 400 grand in back pay? Not, Careful with that. Not necessarily. They're actually looking to basically finance the majority of themselves and maybe bring one other person. Mm. But not writing a check as soon as they get the financing. Maybe more so when they get the quid. So when the company's actually profitable and making money and bringing cash there. So they're not even looking at, I guess, getting salary, high salaries out of the check. But Minimize the liabilities on your balance sheet. That's a liability. It's a future payment. It's a balloon payment. I, I recommend giving them just a little bit more equity. I, I probably yeah. yeah. What's the? So I'm curious about the silent partner business. What can you say a little bit more about that? And why did they come into the picture? I think sometimes this pops up on cap tables, and it's an interesting thing to pause on and talk about. Sure. So it's an international business. So he's overseas, and therefore they. It's not that they're not interested or that they, they're not completely silent as if they wrote the check and they've disappeared off into the blue. Um, they, you know, they keep up, they have calls, etc. but they're not in the country in which the business is running. So they basically, they've invested their money, they, you know, give perspective, they have discussions, but they're not, that's all they can do. So he's the one essentially building the company. And that's how that works. What, what advice, what other advice would you have for managing a situation like that where early almost angel slash advisors are, are on the cap table? Well, you're not drawing a salary, right? <laughs> so you have, shared, you, know, you have a shared sort of sweat equity, as Joe was saying mm -hmm. earlier. I don't see a reason to accrue cash. I think if they're interested in the, this thing, they're already working for the equity. I'm sorry, I, I don't yeah. think anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there is some investment in terms of sweat equity work, right, that you're making in order to build the company. So you can't backtrack on that. Let's go right here. Uh, what are your, your thoughts on hiring offshore, particularly when money is tight? Yeah. Great be question. Be very careful. I mean, I, I, have, I don't have any, well, that's not true. I have maybe just one or two examples where I've seen it work really well. I think oftentimes, you think it's going to save you money, um, and it ends up not. Um, I think, it, you know, from an engineering perspective, where I've seen it work is a, you know, a lot of due diligence done up front about where it's going to go, and then very specific pieces of work that are being done. Um, but it takes lots of management oversight. Um, it takes lots of communication at all hours of the day. So I think just really make sure that it's, going to give you what you want before you get into that it can be very complex. The only time I've seen it work is when one of the founders is actually in that geography yeah. for a period of time. But I agree with everything Beth said. Yeah, I mean, at a company I was at called Fusion One, which probably most of you don't remember, but it, 
we spent $10 million on uh, advertising before we had revenue or a real product. So it was a qu quite interesting time in the Valley. And we ended up buying a very small company in Tallinn, Estonia. And this was like in 1999, which was quite before its time to go to Eastern Europe. And it actually worked really, really well. But we had a, the head of engineering ended up going there. It was very specific that they were doing QA. Um, but that's about the only time that I've ever seen it really work well and, and actually save money. Yeah, I think Joe's point is really key. I, I think as companies grow, what I'm seeing with some of my companies, they are working with you're probably more consulting entities mm -hmm. in those countries That's to right. do specific right. work. So it might be, you know, in the mobile world, might be porting or That's phone right. software or something. Or, you know, they, they, you know, depending on whether it's India, Russia, mm -hmm. wherever, there's certain sort of pools of talent, software talent, for example, that you can leverage, but you have to structure it and it has mm -hmm. to be defined. Otherwise, it's, and for a very early stage company, it's, it's hard. It Let's hard. go right behind you. Yep. No, I'm sorry, you, yeah. Um, <laughs> If you're in the project phase of just developing your startup for the beginning and you have a technology guy and a business person, um, if you wait too long to discuss the cap table, then the technology person might start wanting more like 50 50. But if you discuss it earlier, then you can sort of put it out there that you're only aware of the above, like, you know, 30 or 20. Um, is there any, like, thing just describe the nuances and reconciling that? Like, when is the right time to talk? Um, break down or? Hold out as long as you can. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. I mean, I think you have to be you have to be careful about that though, because you don't want to destroy trust with with these people that you're working with. So I think for me, it would depend on how far along the path you are, what the relationship is, right. what is your level of certainty that this is actually going to work out, um, how important that person is going to be to the long term success of the company. All good points. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm going to be a little outnumbered here, maybe on the tech side. <laughs> um, sometimes that sweat equity we've been talking about, and Zach kind of got to it a little bit, might be true equity as opposed to investing plans. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, uh, particularly in your case, um, uh, if your technical side, your counterpart, has actually developed some of your IP already, mm -hmm. and then you were both going to the VC, for instance, mm -hmm. to raise money. I'm very interested to hear the difference between the equity mm -hmm. that IP is worth to perhaps more to the technical counterpart than the investing equity going forward. So maybe you can speak to that. I've never had that. Janice, what do you think, founder stock versus uh, investing equity? Yeah, you, I, I think so, but it, it was still vest. Yeah. yeah everything vests. Everything, everything vests. Vest. So you're not just going to say, hey, this is it, you can cash out tomorrow. I think you're not purchasing at that point, I think, right. of the company's evolution. That's the thing you're not purchasing. You want people involved who are going to continue to stay. Because, you know, in an early stage company, you have IP and nobody, to, nobody else. I mean, right. you know, that's, what are you going to do with it? So I think that you need to get people aligned by... You know, allocating stock appropriately for, you know, work and, and maybe IP. And it's an interesting situation. But, you know, you need, that needs to vest so that you're all aligned going forward and, you know, you're actually you're working for the company. And it sounds like uh, maybe one way to knit these two scenarios is that the technical contributions in the form of software or, or hardware or expertise has to be on the ledger of things that you're tallying up when you say, okay, how are we going to divide this up? Okay, I've been working on it for six months, but I'm just an MBA. You've been here 30 days and have built this fabulous application. How do we weight those two things? And, and, and the reason these partnerships blow up is typically because of simple things like communication. Yeah. People yeah. don't actually get a chance to say out loud what their underlying interest is or what their underlying goals and ambitions are. And if you have that conversation and you've got that chemistry that these guys talked about, a lot of times those things kind of magically merge and you come out with an answer that's like, oh yeah, that's cool, We sign me up. And, and, it, and it works out a lot easier. You're going to have different roles. You know, yeah. you might bring the IP and you're going to continue working on that and you're going to go out and bring people and money into the business and you know, but this, you've got to be talking, communicating, yeah. spending time together, all those things, understanding. That, that question of do you delay as long as you can, you might, might be creating a problem. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of transparency. I mean, I just think if you are holding something back with someone that you're really relying on, it's going to cause problems. <laughs> so. So, uh, yeah, let's come back on this side. Um, so as a rookie entrepreneur, we really 
useful to understand how, what specifically at a very like granular level how you go about contacting people on like LinkedIn that you want to target, how you go about finding people on Craigslist, how you mine your network, like what specifically I'm talking about like wording and strategy about how to find those people that you might that you need to complete your team. Do you have a specific position in mind? Because it might be good to have a hardcore example sure, that we sure. can. Uh, so I'm co-founding a company with a graduate from the Lee School from last year. I'm a senior MBA here. We're looking for someone that is a, a developer here. We currently have an offshore developer uh, in the Ukraine, and we're looking for someone that's local here that we can iterate our product faster with. Mm -hmm. And so somebody who would be either at the CTO level or at the you know, senior developer level. Uh, and then we found that to be probably more difficult than I would have thought to do in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. that too. Yeah. Great question. Well, we've, we've, we've actually used social networking as a tool. It is a component of what we actually do. And, and the best way to do it is to uh, subscribe to the, what is it, the corporate edition of LinkedIn? Yeah. So there's a corporate edition. It's Pay for the most expensive edition. one, please. Shameless plug for one of our companies. companies, right? companies right? yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, the, uh, the LinkedIn, I wouldn't do Craigslist. You're going to yeah, end up spending the next six months of your time filtering through eight million resumes that don't make any sense. But I would say do the keyword searches of LinkedIn. Think about the companies from which you want to draw the gene pool talent. So if you're a developer, then what kind of developer? Is this an infrastructure software company? Is it a web development company? What is your category? And then think about, okay, am I a zebra? Then where else are the other zebras hanging out? Where are they, what watering holes are they, are they living nearby? And thinking about the best companies in that space, and then I would do keyword searches for those companies, and then keyword searches for the skill sets you're looking for. That'll pop a bunch of names, and then what you do is you send them in mail. So you can do an in mail, if you, and it's only 25 bucks a month per user. I mean, it's not much, and or I think the corporate edition is only like 250 bucks a year. And so um, I think Joe brought some coupons. For yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> free 30 day trial. That, that was what I'd, be, what I'd do, is pop the very precise, be, try and be precise. The people are gonna bring the domain expertise, the technical expertise that you really want right now, and the more surgical you are in that process, the better. Like there may be, there's, there are companies in, uh, there are universities in Romania, and in uh, Ukraine, and in Russia, that are all you know, computer science centers of excellence, and they've got you know, development companies. The only, the real issue and the real risk point there is obviously how do you protect your IP, because you don't know, but one last thing I was going to say to your earlier point uh, is go. I'm sorry, it was you. Go to the place that you're going to recruit. Don't 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 do this by phone. You got to travel there, and it's a lots of 18 hour or 24 hour deal to get to Romania and places like that. You got to get on the ground, go meet these people, spend time with them. Uh, don't try and do it all remotely. That's what I do. So um, I've, I've heard a little discussion, but I wanted to crystallize it around the time that the founder is looking for. So you work on taking an extreme example, something you can use. Okay, it's a really hard problem. You figured it out, and you can now articulate a very simple business case. And you're looking for uh, the CEO or the CTO. You realize that it's not yourself. What is that dialogue around? Uh, very transparent, very trusting. Open, but what is that dialogue around equity uh, in the first instance? I think, I well, you know, you've got IP, you've got an asset, and uh, you want to commercialize it, right? So you're going to have to, and assuming you can't do it on your own, either financially or because of skills. So you have to sort of be very clear with your own, with yourself, you know, about you know how you're going to do this, what you're prepared to give up in a way, in order to achieve, you know, the opportunity of building a company along the way. You know, nobody's going to come to you and say, hey, you know, I don't think. I mean, if you wanted to sell something, you'd go somewhere to sell it, right? But you're wanting to build a company, so you've got to share in that company going forward. So you're not going to get paid for 10 years of hours worked. Right. But, you know, it's a negotiation with the people you bring in. And, and again, you know, you have to bring in people you trust. You can triangulate with people you know. And, and you have to sit down, you have to, it, it's a negotiation, and, and you yourself, I mean, at the end of the day, it's your decision to decide, I'm going to, I want to go for this opportunity to build this company. Because if you've got IP, you can go and sell it to someone. But I don't, I want to build a company. So you're going to have to think really clearly. And again, talk to so many of the people that you, you know, you know or can be introduced to through this fabulous network you have. And sort of, okay, in order to do this, what has been done before? What is reasonable? And then you, you, know, you negotiate with the people you want to work with. And then you have to sort of, it, it really is your decision in a way. You know, okay, so I'm going to give up 
this much of equity to bring in this person who I believe can build a company with me. And I've got to feel good about that decision because it may work, it may not, but I'm not going to get paid for that 10 years unless it works, but this is the way I choose to go forward. And you know, it takes courage, yes. right? It takes the right partnership. Otherwise, go and sell the IP right. to Hewlett Packard or whoever it is, depending on who, you know. Great point, let's go here. Can you talk about a situation where you're both, this is my situation, founder, and I put the money into the LLC, got everything off the ground, we have customers, et cetera. Um, you know, and my lawyers at Cooley say I should still have a vesting schedule. And I guess I'm confused because it's my money, it's yeah, my vision, my executed money. Why when DC money comes in now, should I be vested? Does that give them an interest to Because you're you talking about it? the future, you right. know? It's, it's you're going forward to build a company together, so you need to be aligned going forward. Right. Past is past. But founders versus can I have now employee, you know, that's what I mean, this money I put in, isn't it already in, versus yeah. other options that are best? Is, is founder equity? I have seen founder. founders sell some of their stock in an A yes, round. I have yes, too. Yes, and yes, take some yes, liquidity. Yes. They say, right. the, the VCs will say, I'll give you a little bit to take some risk off the table so you're not worrying about paying your mortgage, right. but I'm not going to buy your equity out because right. where's your motivation? It goes out the door with the stock you just right. sold. Right. But recognize there are implications with that yeah. too. There Big are. implications with right. your common share price. Uh, that's right. So that's something to be really wary of. Think about what happens, what happens if you don't invest. You're going to just walk away if you Right. Yeah. The I, VCs I've, want to make sure that you're going to be around. I've never seen it. Now, the part that's nego highly negotiable is what's the part of your previous vesting that you'll get credit for right. Right. as of the financing. So you, it's not going to go back to zero, right. but it's not also going to be fully vested. So think about that as one of the var variables that a founder gets to negotiate with, with, with investors. Yes, sir. Um, when you're um, thinking about compensation packages for the many different roles you're going to hire during the many different stages of financing, C, Series A, B, and so forth, um, what's the best way for someone to um, uh, find out what are market rates, what are precedents? So, you know, if I'm trying to hire someone and saying, okay, I'm going to give you 20 basis points, and they're, th they're thinking, oh, my friend, He's a CTO. This guy's a journalist. He's a CTO. He's getting five percent. Right. You know, it's a really big jump, and it's hard to say. You know, come on board. This is a really great deal. I should only give you be giving you fifty basis points because I love you. Uh, I'm doing a great deal. Uh, what What's the best way to find these market rates? It's, it's It's really hard. I mean, I think there's there's no hard and fast rules to equity out there. Unfortunately, I mean, I think I would really rely on your VCs and your attorneys to give you what what they've seen, and I think. You know, what I've experienced is people don't understand equity at all, um, to Michael's point. I mean, people will come into Facebook and, and you know, it is an engineer and say, I want, you know, 2%. I'm like, well, it's just never going to happen. Like, it's just not going to happen. So, but they didn't, they didn't understand. You know, they really did not understand what it could mean. So I think you have to make sure that you can articulate kind of the, you know, what the play is, what you see the company doing, the challenge of the work and where, you know, what this would mean for them. Because I think people just don't understand. And then use, you know, use your partners to, to try to get data. There's no published tool that I know of that can tell you what to give them. Now, one thing I will tell you from experience, so it's, it's so a company grows, and, and early on, you tend to have lots of conversation about percentages. As yes. the company grows, you need to get off the That's percentages. Right. Yeah. That's right. Because you're really talking about the number of shares and the value That's right. that you can accrue from those shares over time if the company is successful. So, you know, if you're a little ways down the road and you're still talking percentages, it's it very difficult because yes. it, it's sort of, it's really hard because people... You know, they have these percentages, but they're not necessarily related in terms of the stage of the company. That's right. So you just get off that and you talk about, you know, numbers of shares. And there are benchmarks out there. Mm -hmm. You know, but you, you know, everybody veers off them because if you want a superstar, you'll tend to compensate for a superstar. But there is benchmarking, you know, formal and informal. Formal, there's lots of studies. Informal through venture capital firms. And we do our own mm -hmm. independent studies as well. And we obviously talk to each other. And you normally have two or more around a board. So you'll get that dialogue as well. But the other thing is, you know, 2% of something is better than 10% of nothing. So, you know, you really need to articulate the value of your company That's too, right. right? And how you're going to build that company. So it's not just about the percentage. It's about the value you're going to create and the vision. And, you know, you can argue, I mean, you really want someone who obviously wants to be co compensated fairly, but also someone who's buying into what you're trying to create. 
so that they will have some share of that going forward. So it's not just about the percentage in isolation of what you're trying to do. Okay, one minute, last question. Hey, just really quick in terms of kind of some creative structuring around how not to do equity for the kid to be. I start to a lawyer recently talked about stock appreciation rights, and basically trying to use them as a competitive compensation tool. I'd just love to get your thoughts on some of that type of creative structuring, whether or not you get the same effect. Don't be that creative. Yeah, That's I agree. Right. Be keep standard. It, keep I, it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah, simple yeah, vanilla. Yeah, yeah. And to, uh, I think it was uh, Beth's earlier point, parity. Everybody should have the same stock option plan. Establish a stock option plan. That is the documentation. Don't let anybody one off it or customize it because you're going to end up with a, you know, a, a basket of stuff that you can't even understand. You spend all your time doing contracts for people. One plan, every employee. Yeah, this creativity complexity thing, you know, complexity out, creativity, focus on the business, not yeah. the comp That's structure. Right. There you go. And a great note to end on. Thank our panelists for coming today. Thanks, everybody.